I'm Laura Boosinger and welcome to the Face of Appalachia. I did not grow up here, but my mother grew up in a very large family in northern Louisiana where they grew a garden and she had a cow growing up and chickens and they had an outhouse till one of the sisters got old enough to make money working in the paper mill and put a, a, a bathroom in the house. There were 11 kids in that family. And so when we would go back to Louisiana for family reunions, we had Thanksgiving, there'd be 60, 65 people. And the kind of food, there was everything you can imagine. We had a turkey, we had two kinds of ham, I don't know why. There was a pot of chicken and dumplings, there were butter beans, there were purple hull peas, there was cornbread, then there was that really fancy uh, brown and serve rolls, that was your company cooking right there. You know, m multiple cakes and pies and kids and grow old people and young people. And so I think when I came here, we didn't live near my grandmother. People around here don't have a particularly uh, fond smell uh, relationship with the smell of the paper mill. I do. We live three days drive from my grandmother. When you could get close enough to smell the paper mill, you knew you were almost there. And there were so many things that were gonna happen when I got there. There was real iced tea with lemons, which we never had. There was also gonna be purple whole peas for me and stewed potatoes for my brother and chicken and dumplings, things we never ate where I grew up but also this massive amount of people around my grandmother's um, kitchen table. You know, every morning at 10 o'clock, the ants were there and talking. And as soon as people talk about what time do you eat dinner? Well, they ate dinner when it was done. I've had dinner at 10.30 in the morning plenty of times. And then Aunt Willie would go home, but she'd come back for coffee at four o'clock, you know? That's kind of what I was been looking for my whole life, was to land in a community where that kind of thing happened. And that's one thing the music brought me to, was my own sense of family that I didn't really get to grow up with every, on an everyday basis. When I worked downtown Asheville in the 1980s, it was really quiet in downtown Asheville in the 1980s. But my friend, uh, Turner Stevens, found out where I was and he came to see me once in a while. He was a real character, banjo player, shape note singer, his mama and him used to come to the shape note singings. And uh, he came in one day and he taught me this song. And it was a song I learned later that Bascom Lunsford collected over in Jackson County. And it was called Going to Italy. Turner's version was a little different than Bascom's, but that's all right. And I thought, why are people in Jackson County singing about going to Italy, especially, you know, 50, 75 years ago? Because they weren't even coming to Asheville. But I found out that over in Jackson County, there's a little community called Italy. And it's across the mountain from Canada. There you have it. Fingering, fingering, shines like glittering gold. I'm going to get that gal mine before she gets too old. I'm going to Italy for long, for long, for long. Going to Italy for long to see that gal Italy for long, for long, for 
I'm Tim Barnwell. It's another beautiful day here in Western North Carolina. You've been listening to my longtime friend, musician Laura Boozinger. I sat down with Laura recently and we had a wide ranging conversation about her musical career, playing traditional music, and many of the people she met and played with over the years, including four-time Grammy Award winner David Holt and the Luke Smathers Band. She's also performed at many area music festivals, including the annual Mountain Dance and Folk Festival, started in 1928 by Bascom Lamar Lunsford in Asheville, North Carolina, and the Shindig on the Green, also in Asheville. Laura also talks about small towns in western North Carolina, including Canton, where the Champion Paper Mill, the centerpiece of the community, is set to close this summer. And Laura will sing and play some tunes on her banjo. I hope you enjoy this incredible musician, as I have over the years. Hi, I'm Laura Boosinger. I have lived in Asheville since, well, I came here to go to school in 1976, east of Asheville, and I didn't really ever leave. I went back to Durham where my parents were living two of those summers, but we had just moved to Durham when I came to go to college at Warren Wilson down here. So I didn't have any reason really to go home to Durham except I was 18 and 19. So my parents kind of thought I had a reason to go home. And, uh, but then I figured out pretty much how to stay in Asheville my last year of college and, and stayed here after I graduated. I'd gotten into playing traditional music at Warren Wilson with David Holt. And there's so many players here and so many interesting people that I'd become acquainted with and historic things like the Mountain Dance and Folk Festival, which is the oldest folk festival in the country, continuing folk festival. So. There are lots of reasons for me to stay here. Besides, it's beautiful, so why wouldn't you want to live here? Well, I think the first time I saw you play was at the Mountain Dance and Folk Festival with uh, the Luke Smathers Band. I have pictures of that from, I guess, an assignment I did at the time, but I remember seeing you there and remember that vividly. So There's a cute picture over there on the piano of us at the Mountain Dan Dance and Folk Festival. Uh, Luke and his brother started playing in the 1920s. I think Luke got his first fiddle when he was mm, 13 or 14. Harold got a guitar and their brother George, who was 18, got a guitar and they started playing music there in Canton, North Carolina, where they lived. Um, Luke and Harold both worked at the paper mill at, in Canton and it's, they played music that was traditional, but they liked to listen to the radio. Luke had a great story. He said if in the 1920s, even in the early 30s, if you wanted to listen to the radio on Saturday night in Canton, you had to take the battery out of the car and hook it up to the radio. He said you'd get a real um, scorching if you ran the bat battery down during the week and they couldn't listen to the radio. So they pulled in the Grand Old Opera on Saturday nights and eventually the WLS Barn Dance out of Chicago. And then all those programs out of New York City like the Rainbow Room and the, all those ballroom shows, you know, and eventually the Renfro Valley Barn Dance. So their repertoire was everything from tr traditional fiddle tunes to pop songs like um, Darktown Strutter's Ball, then to swing numbers like uh, Whispering and uh, Duke Ellington tunes. I mean, their repertoire was incredible. Interestingly, people think they weren't educated. They did learn all this music by um, ear, but the paper mill, the champion paper mill, had hired a band director and brought the, the paper mill did a lot for these small communities. This was not, it was pretty much the opposite of what you hear about coal mining companies. They came in and tried to improve the community. They built the Y, they built the recreation park, they'd have entertainment come in and hire out the auditorium or so all their employees could go at no cost. So they hired this band director and he was really taken with, with Luke and Harold and those guys. Quace Mathers played the tenor banjo and he offered um, brass instruments. So they had an orchestra at the paper mill, but they also had a marching band. And Quay told a funny story about marching in the Asheville Christmas Parade. He played the tuba and he said, man, going up those hills in Asheville was hard to play the tuba, but you could give it all you had going down the hills, you know. Tell me about how you got to play with them, how you started with them. Well, they were regulars at the Shindig on the Green and at the Mountain Dance and Folk Festival. And when David was playing with them, David Holt, I would go look for them. They'd always get us room backstage at the Thomas Wolfe Auditorium. They'd have one of the little rehearsal rooms. And I'd go in there and try to play along. And eventually David's, and that's Shindig as well, David's touring schedule got so um, robust that he wasn't playing with them anymore. And I asked if I could come to the kitchen on a Sunday night. They played in their kitchen, which was Bee's Kitchen. 
And they said, sure. And it was the hardest music I ever tried to learn to play. It was a completely, I had to play a bunch of different styles. I had to play a tenor style up here on the neck where I mostly just chorded. And then well, on the fiddle tunes, I had to play the regular claw hammer style, but then I had to learn how to sing all these different kinds of songs from Western swing songs to these pop tunes that they played. So that was a challenge, but pretty fun. Their sound was just so different and it just amazed me and they were really interesting people too. So it was super fun to play with them. Yeah, so when David started touring more, you kind of stepped in and became part of the band? Well, I, yeah, I didn't actually know I was part of the band until after I'd been going to practices for a couple months and they said, we're playing at Balsam at the fire department for 4th of July, can you come and play? Yeah, sure, you know, so that luckily that was a low pressure gig. And then not far after that, we played, long after that, we played at the Swannanoa Gathering. And that was probably the most nervous I ever have been playing a gig because the chord progressions were complicated and it was not just three chords and a capo. So it was tricky, but it was super fun. I mean, we got to play really fun gigs because they were just so interesting. So what, um, what kind of attracted you to the banjo uh, out of... Uh, the instruments that were available to you growing up? Well, I played guitar since I was in the eighth grade. You know, not great, but I fooled, you know, like any teenager, fooled around on the guitar. And then when I came to Warren Wilson, um, they said you could take banjo lessons for essentially $15. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. I hadn't been around this kind of music until I came to Warren Wilson. I didn't know the difference between bluegrass and claw hammer. In fact, in my childhood, probably the banjo playing I knew of was at um, Shakey's Pizza with a tenor banjo and a piano where you had sing-alongs. I thought that was great. And at Disneyland, there was a ten tenor banjo on the Mark Twain steamboat, which is interesting that that whole steamboat thing kind of came around my life with my re relationship with John Hartford. But I didn't know about traditional Southern Mountain music. I mean, I knew about the Kingston Trio. I knew about the Beatles. I knew about John Denver. That was probably as close as I was going to get, but I didn't really know about this other music. I did know about The House of the Rising Sun, because I guess we all knew that from the radio back in the day. Yeah. So really, was it Warren Wilson that you started picking up the banjo? Yeah. Just as a lark. Why not? And I took lessons that first semester, and then I went home that Christmas and ordered a Stuart McDonald kit banjo. And I went out into the garage and my dad and I put it together and my parents thought I'd lost my mind. They were like, she's going to make a banjo? What? So daddy and I put this banjo together and it was a, it is a great banjo. And it was my main banjo till 1991. It's the one I recorded with and played with early on. So what was it that, other than the cheap lessons, that made you continue with it? I think it's the sound. The sound is just... One thing about playing old time banjo is you learn different tunings and it gets a very deep warm sound or it gets a very spooky sound or a very um, lively sound for dancing. It has, the old time banjo has so much emotional capacity. When I started playing at the Tennessee Homecoming at the Museum of Appalachia over in Norris, Tennessee, which celebrated families that were flooded out of their land when the Norris Dam was put in. They had a homecoming for folks to come home. And back in the early days, it was crazy people were there, like Grandpa Jones and Brother Oswald and Archie Campbell, you know. And that's where I really got to be friends with John Hartford. And I think getting um, great affirmation from John Hartford was also a moment where I thought, wow, maybe I do have something to give back. I would have maybe not known that if he hadn't pulled me aside and said that. So tell me a little bit more about your relationship with him. Well, the first time I met him, we, there was a local radio show that was being produced, mostly for Armed Forces Radio, called The Liberty Flyer. And they wanted to do a series of short, pro, well, there'd be a spot on every show where we'd be in B's kitchen and they wanted John Hartford involved. So we recorded a whole day with John in B's kitchen. And so that's how I got to know him. I didn't know anything about John's real history. 
I mean, I didn't, I mean, I knew he wrote Gentle on my mind, but I didn't really know anything else about him. So that's how I started to know him. And then being with him at the museum, he'd invite me up to play with him. He learned a song from me that he put on a record and gave me a big credit, which was really sweet. He recorded on two of my records. He was always very encouraging. So I always had John's, um, I always had his blessing, really. When the fiddle tune book came out a couple years ago, his daughter was going through the manuscripts. He had notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of tunes that he had written out and his beautiful calligraphy. And his daughter sent me a Facebook message with a photograph of one of the songs and said, I think this is for you. And the song was called Laura Boo. Yeah, it is. Totally amazing. You know, if you went to a shape note singing, there were all manner of ages. You had dinner on the ground. There was a social time. There was a spiritual time singing the music. If you go to Shindig, it was the same thing. There'd be all kinds of little groups all around the stage down there and playing all kinds of music. And you'd go listen to one. And somebody was always there who just came off the road with Bill Monroe. And there was Ralph Lewis and his boys or... Mark Pruitt might show up before he went down to play at the barbecue there at Bill Stanley's. So you never quite knew. That's kind of the beauty of Shindig. You kind of never know who's going to show up. It's, so it's an ever-changing, exciting program every Saturday night, you know, because you don't quite know what's going to be there. But it's community. It's what it is about is community. Well, I think it's, you know, it just amazes me, like in Haywood County, how many musical families, Suttons and everybody are... Tranthems. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In those areas, it's always... Been pretty fascinating. Well, and then the queens have the you know the hold on the dance too. So there's just so many communities around here where there's you know Madison County known for the ballad singing for generations, generations and generations of unbroken ballad singing tradition in Madison County. I remember the first time the Queen family showed up at Shindig on the Green. They literally exploded on the stage. They had so much energy and Henry Queen was extraordinary, and their little mama was there, probably clapping her hands. Remember how the old ladies would do like this? And she might have, I might be making this up, but she might have had her pocketbook, I don't know. But everything about them visually and musically was absolutely incredible, and it was three generations. And the singing was raw, but it was right, and the playing was good, and it was just, but it was two daughters, a mother, a son, a, a grandson, and another son a whole family experience. And that was a lot of what you used to see at Shindig in the old days. And I was really amazed that a family kept a tradition like that going for so many generations. I certainly didn't have that kind of thing in my family. And I grew up moving around a lot, so I never lived anywhere long enough to know about a tradition in a community until I came here. And I think as much as anything, that's what drew me to the music. I wanted to, go to Quay and Sue's and play music with the family and Sue would send me home with something out of the garden and she'd always have something to eat. If you went to Fiddler's Grove, all the hippie musicians, the young hippie musicians would go to their camp because they had three good looking girls and a food. Sue always had food. So if you hadn't had anything to eat, that's where you'd go and get something to eat. And of course, then I started doing the shape note singing with them as well. And a variety of kinds of things I learned from them. I spent a whole summer with Sue canning stuff. We didn't can in my family. My mother thought bird's eye was all that, you know. So being with Sue and learning how to make jelly and preserve peaches and put up fried squash and make her soup mix, which went in the freezer all right from her garden, right into a can. And learn about her experience as a child 
going to a canning school out in Spring Creek when uh, she was the one that was, she was nine or 10, but her daddy sent her to that canning school because her mother had died and she was the one who could remember everything and write stuff down, so. Tell me about meeting Baby Seeger. Well, I was playing at the Tow River Music Festival um, up in Yancey County and I had the first set and I was supposed to do some kids music. And one summer I picked up a copy of um, Mike and Peggy and Penny Seeger's Folk Songs for Children, American Folk Songs for Children recording. And I learned a couple songs off of there and one of them was this funny song about a little pig. So I sing this song and I got all the kids oinking at the appropriate part and the set's over and this guy from Black Mountain comes up and says, where'd you learn that song? And he was standing next to this other woman, this woman, and I didn't know her. He said, where did you learn that song? I said, off of this really cool Mike and Peggy and Penny Seeger American Folk Songs for Children record. And he goes, this is Peggy Seeger. And it was, you know, the Seeger family all the way back to her father and her stepbrother P and even her mother who was an accomplished and recognized uh, female American composer. I don't know if you knew that, Ruth Crawford Seeger. Their families made such an impact on traditional music and other kinds of music, American music, really, across the board. So it was really delightful to meet her. But then we got to know each other a little bit and uh, she was very complimentary of my singing and I was so happy to know her sort of at a real human personal level as, as opposed to, well, this is the Peggy Seeger, you know. And of course, the song, the first time I ever saw your face, one of the most poignant love songs ever written about her by her lover, not even her husband at that point. And she did an exquisite version of that um, this spring in 2023 that you should look at. It's really incredible. I hope I grow up to have as much dignity and finesse and genuineness as Peggy Seeger in her 80s. If you share my interest in the people and places I call home, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons to learn more about this way of life. On this channel, I hope to continue to celebrate the people, culture, and rich heritage of Appalachia.